But so thank you very much for inviting me through this webinar to present uh, in Slovenia. And uh, it's a shame that I cannot attend in person, which I would have liked uh, because uh, the last couple of years I've had the opportunity to visit and I am most impressed with your uh, city, country and your hospitality and culture. So I hope to be able to visit uh, again. Uh, I'd like to just start by sharing my screen. So I think the easiest way is the whole screen. And let's see if that works. Right. Are you able to now see my slides? Uh, yes. I, yeah, you can. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm very happy for you, one of you, to uh, unmute your, uh, your mic and ask me a question at any time. Uh, but I think uh, I'm also able to take questions via chat. That would also be great. Um, I wish they were bigger. Did you mean my slides were bigger? Uh, okay, can you now see my slides properly? I, I, can you confirm, uh, Jaka, if my slide is okay at the moment? Yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you. So we can now see that the chat also works for the communication. Uh, just say a few words in general about three days that we will have together. Uh, my idea is to talk about systematic reviews, randomized trials, and diagnostic research. But before the end of today, if you have things on your mind and in your wish list, then please do let me know by by end of today, so I can I prepare materials you would like for me to cover tomorrow and day after. I'd also like to say that uh, I think we have around two hours for us to spend time together. But if, in, uh, if we finish early or need a bit longer, then I am flexible as long as. Uh, you have uh, patience and perseverance and tolerance of my of my uh, presentation. So with this, uh, we'll proceed with uh, today's topic. So my idea is to present something about systematic review. Uh, we'll make a presentation. There'll be some activities that I'd like you to undertake, question and answer sessions. And I'd like to focus in my presentation on writing tips, because I presume some of you would like to use what you are learning through this uh, course to submit manuscripts, but frequently manuscripts after review uh, may be rejected, and then you may need revision, but I would like for you to be able to go through in one cycle and have your manuscript accepted. So uh, uh, I hope you will be able to learn something not just about systematic reviews, trials, and diagnostic research, but also about how to present what you have done in a manner that you can convince journal editors and peer reviewers quickly and convincingly get yourself uh, onto the publication uh, ladder. So here are the five different sets of uh, systematic review. Uh, uh, taken from this publication. This publication is uh, a 
is, is a very brief summary of the book that uh, that was referred to just a moment ago. And uh, if you don't mind, I expand a little bit on my own history. I started medical school in 1983 in Pakistan. I had an opportunity to work in Kenya, where I started career as a gynecologist. Uh, Returned to Pakistan, then went to McMaster University in Canada, and then I worked in the UK for several years. Uh, and uh, recently I moved to uh, Spain in University of Granada. The University of Granada has uh, a university over 500 years old, and uh, you see in the picture on the right, inside the Alhambra Palace. Um, you, you may or may not know that the journey to discover uh, what we call the New World, the two North and South Americas, um, started here in Granada when the Queen called Israel gave the money requested by uh, Christopher Columbus, or Cristobal Colon, as we call him in Spanish, uh, in 1492. Just last month uh, was the annual celebration of, the, of, the, of this discovery. Uh, and I live just where this palace that you look uh, that you're looking at in the picture is. So I, I, I'm very happy to be able to present the webinar to you from this location. Well, superimpose on this journey, what happened to my research career? So I had my first publication in 1990. Uh, soon after my training in research in uh, in 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 uh, in Canada, I had my first publication of a systematic review. So you can see that I've been in this business of writing papers and systematic reviews for nearly twenty five to thirty years. And uh, I had the opportunity to edit various journals, including editor in chief of the British Journal of, of Obstetrics and Ecology. Uh, here is uh, a graph showing several of my of my uh, citations to my publications. And I had the opportunity to present about uh, research and systematic reviews in more than thirty seven countries, uh, including your own. The most important thing about my publications here, you see my 150 publications listed uh, by year of publication. Most important thing about this is this orange line, which represents the number of participants whose data were used in. Um, the papers I have been able to summarize in the systematic reviews. You can see that reviews are quite large with more than 100 studies included. Uh, but some reviews are also quite small with around 10 or 15 studies. Um, and the total number of the participants in my reviews exceeds several tens of millions. So. I like to highlight from what I present here that the most important thing about a review is not just your self as an author of a review or the papers included inside your review, but actually the data given by the patients who consented to take part and permitted the use of their data to allow for the publication and then for development of 
an improvement of clinical practice. So we'll move on uh, from here onwards to talking about what is evidence-based medicine and systematic reviews. How can we develop a, a research question and a search strategy? And then I also like you yourself to undertake a little activity concerning preparation of uh, a research question. But before I proceed, may I just ask if you have any questions or comments which you do by by writing a comment or unmuting your microphone and uh, asking me the question directly. Uh, stop here for a moment, take a sip of my cup of tea and see if you have any question or comment. Okay, so I presume you can all hear me well. You can see my slides and that you don't have any question or comment at this stage and I can proceed. So with that, we go on to the next uh, stage, which is what do clinicians want uh, from... Uh, or researchers. So I understand most of you are undertaking a PhD program. Our objective is to produce uh, science, and the clinician objective is to use the science that you will publish as publications uh, in journals or as a thesis like to pick up this published material and combine it with the belief, judgment, and intuition. And this combination will hopefully allow them to provide treatments to their patients in a way that their patients will in the end be able to get a higher quality of care. So from what I just said, I guess you can see that I'm talking about evidence-based medicine. The key thing I want to highlight is that this thing on the right-hand side of the slide, i.e. The, the papers published, form the E for the practice of evidence-based medicine. So... For a clinician, they, when they face a problem, they should be able to form a clear question, search the literature. By searching the literature, they will acquire the papers that could address their question. Hopefully, some of these papers are written by yourselves. And um, they will raise your paper. If they find that the information contained in your paper is trustworthy, and hopefully they will be able to apply the findings of your papers to improve clinical practice. So the key thing is for you to undertake your research in a manner that when it is assessed by others, it is found to be uh, trustworthy. And if it is found be trustworthy, then they can use it for improving clinical practice. So how does this work in real life when a clinical problem is faced? A clinician or clinical team can use their experience, expertise to make decisions, or they can ask questions, acquire literature, appraise the information, and combine this with their experience to make decisions, and hopefully these are more refined 
and uh, nuanced with respect to clinical care. So what type of research is there which clinicians can use? Uh, so I, for the purpose of simplicity, break research down in what I call laboratory research or research that uses data directly from patients or groups of patients uh, living in organized societies or populations. And we can call this patient-centered research and research that is that, is, that deploys cells and tissues, which may or may not come from human beings as laboratory research. And I like to make the distinction that laboratory research designed to improve knowledge, whereas patient-centered research is designed to help make decisions. Uh, this is a big distinction between the two types of research. Uh, you can call the laboratory research basic research and patient-centered research as applied research. So when we talk about applied research, we are talking about how lab research can be changed into health impact. And this involves a journey which is called translational journey. And this goes through various steps. And again, for the purpose of simplicity, we can call this going from translation from lab to the very basic levels as T1 research, but then at the next level from clinical efficacy research to clinical effectiveness called T2. And then at the next level from effectiveness to evidence synthesis, which is what we will be talking about today called T3. And at the end of evidence synthesis leading to guideline implementation called T4. And then finally, all of this is into practice, which leads to health impact. So feasibility and pilot studies could be described as uh, as uh, as being T2 translation. Multi-center large clinical trials can be defined as um, well, clinical effectiveness research or T3 translation. Systematic reviews leading to guideline is called T4 translation. And uh, I presume for many of you, your projects probably fall in the category of T2 translation. Uh, I'd also like to highlight to you that systematic reviews are not a million miles away from T2 translation. Uh, feasibility studies, before going into multi-center studies, may require systematic reviews in order to allow us to discover how best to design multi-center studies. And then before multi-center studies can go into definitive systematic reviews, uh, there be there may be further further revisions deploying further systematic reviews and this eventually then leads into guidelines that can have an that can have impact so you can see that the techniques that we will review today together apply not to large multi center studies but also apply to small early pilot and feasibility studies in order to define and deliver progress in translation from basic to, to applied research and then into health impact. So I give you here an example of a randomized trial that was conceived in 1996 
after going through a multi-center phase where nearly 20 hospitals took part, were completed 10 years later, uh, with more than 500 patients recruited, and was in fact then published three years later. But during this time, after conception of the idea, the first systematic review was published in 1997. And then during the course of the trial, a further systematic review was published four years later. And before the end of recruitment, a further systematic review was published uh, another five years later. And then yet another systematic review was published before the publication of this trial. And then at the end of this trial, a further systematic review was published. So you can see that the opportunities to system, systematically synthesize or put together research as it becomes available uh, are many and uh, even during the course of your own thesis work you, within your own topic you may have more than one opportunity to uh, duct and publish systematic reviews so for example the first opportunity that will arise for you to write a systematic review will be with respect to writing the background chapter of your thesis. Here is a, here, here, here is a outline provided for evidence-based practice that a practitioner should look first for guidelines and evidence summaries. If these don't exist, then they should look for actual systematic reviews. If reviews don't exist, then they should look for primary research. And if such research does not exist, then they should conduct their own research. And I guess this type of principle can be also applied in your own thesis work. Um, people often ask, well, what's the difference between reviews and systematic reviews? Well, here is the difference. Uh, reviews and commentaries are like the back chapters that you would have read in many published theses. They are frequently based on information that mixes opinion with evidence. For systematic review, the idea is to limit this so that you don't just use evidence available to you and to your supervisors, but you use all the evidence available in the literature on the question or topic that you would like to study. And in this process, you use critical appraisal and quality assessment in order to limit bias. And meta-analysis is simply a statistical technique applied judiciously to the studies collated inside your systematic review in order to make sense of the information collected. And uh, sometimes we can make sense of the information collected without the need for performing a meta-analysis. So this is a very brief summary of what is a systematic review, what is a meta-analysis, and how this is different from a review or a commentary. I hope that by the end of this webinar series that we will have over three days, that you will be able to think about how you can convert the background chapter of your thesis into a systematic review that can be published in a peer review journal. Um, here I highlight to you the importance of conducting systematic reviews. Uh, 
So in 1993, uh, the total number of kilograms of albumin sold in Scotland and Northern Ireland was this much, and this number remained constant until a systematic review showed that using this product in intensive care units, uh, in fact, was associated with higher, not lower mortality. And once the systematic review was published, the sales of this product went down, indicating that, in fact, clinicians were able to change their practice in light of the data collected and synthesized and published form of a systematic review and meta-analysis. And you can also see that, as a result, hopefully the mortality associated uh, with the, with the inappropriate use of this product uh, went down in the, in, in the end, helping patients and improving the quality of care delivered in intensive care units. I encourage you strongly to think about performing system reviews and publishing them because you might be able to do some good uh, in the area of practice in in your field. So the different steps of conducting a systematic review, framing questions, searching the literature, identifying studies and um, identifying studies and uh, uh, extracting data from them, then performing synthesis, whether or not with meta-analysis, a judgment to be made at that time, and finally summer that information to provide uh, findings to clinicians in a way that can be understood for informing clinical practice. But typically, this type of activity takes an effort from a large number of people over a long period of time. And in the future, it may be possible to change all of this through artificial intelligence, and we may be able to get computers to help us to do this quickly and rapidly, but that time is not today. Today, we're going to have to think through how we can do this, working together in teams. Uh, the area of use of artificial intelligence to assist in systematic reviews is very rapid development. So I, I have no doubt that in a few years when I am making such a presentation, I'll be talking to you about how to use artificial intelligence to do this process uh, of uh, systematic review quickly and rapidly. But today we'll talk about what the process is rather than how softwares can help. And here is the book uh, that was mentioned earlier. It's been translated in, in, in Chinese and uh, in German from its English edition. And uh, we are in the process of the third edition, which will also be translated in uh, Spanish. The first step is framing questions. In order to understand how to frame questions, we've got to think of what is the clinical process. Uh, the process is that presents to us may have some knowledge about their etiology and pathogenesis of the condition they are presenting with, and we may make the diagnosis of the condition using history, examination, and tests. Once we have the diagnosis, we can give therapy, which can hopefully improve the prognosis and achieve a better outcome. For each one of this, of this steps in the clinical process, we have uh, corresponding types of research, etiologic research, for the first 
element of the process, diagnostic research for the second, and prognostic and therapeutic research for the next. And each one of this type of research can be either primary research where data is collected directly from patients, <laughs> or it can be uh, systematic reviews, which collects data from public papers. So I hope you can see the relationship between different steps, clinical process, how primary research can be conducted to assist in each step, and that that research can be put together to conduct systematic reviews to inform each one of the steps. And whether we conduct primary research or systematic reviews, we got to formulate our questions in a way that can be formulated into scientific hypotheses for which we can conduct search to answer the question. To try to think through how we can cons construct scientific questions, I'll give you this picture as, as uh, the source of a curiosity. It leads me to ask a question, is the driver a man or a woman? How can I convert this question into this curiosity into a scientific question? And this, I take you to this four or five components of a question. Participants, intervention exposures and comparisons then outcomes, and then design and methods. So, for me, this picture that led me to this curiosity about the gender of the driver, I can convert this into a question by, uh, by saying, the participants for my curiosity are drivers, index, test or the key information that led me to be curious is the drivers of a BMW who put petrol in their car in this way. The comparison for this information is standard pattern of driving, which is other cars who do not fill petrol in this way. And the method by which I can confirm the gender, which is the outcome of interest to me, could include various tests. Of those tests could be that at some stage, for example, at the next traffic light, I can ask all the drivers to come out of the car and provide me a blood sample from that blood sample, I can test their chromosomes. And from the analysis of the chromosomes, I can determine which type of car driven by, was driven by which gender more or less often. And this can lead to think about the design of my study. So you can see that by becoming curious about information in front of me, I was able to ask a general question, what kind of a person drives this car? And then I was able to convert this into a scientific question by determining who are the participants and and what are their characteristics under different conditions? And then I find ways to confirm the outcome of interest to me. And then once I have information concerning characteristics and outcomes, 
that I can okay, and, and this information is collected through a particular study design. And then with this information, I produce an answer that I can put to a statistical test, which can give me the p-value for my hypothesis. So study design is frequently there is some confusion about study design. We often use the term case control. So in one type of study, we have people who maybe are exposed to a new intervention or a new ex or have a new exposure or have a particular exposure. For example, some people may smoke. The control exposure may be who don't smoke. And then we follow these people up over time and determine if they develop cancer or they don't develop cancer. And we know the percentage of people with or without cancer. And then with this information, we can calculate the effect size, and this is called a cohort study. On the other hand, we may have people with cancer who we call cases, and we may have people without cancer who we may call controls, and we go back in time and ask them to reflect on the previous years of their life and tell us whether or not they were smoking. When we collect this information, we can still put all this information together and calculate an effect size of the relationship between cancer and smoking. And this type of study is called control study. So you can see that in both types of studies, we have participants and exposures and outcomes. But different designs, and there can be confusion between what is a cohort study and what's a case control study. So this is normally uh, also a good step to stop and give an opportunity for questions and comments. So please go ahead and I get ready with the chat to see if we have uh, questions or comments. I presume everybody is aware of how you can unmute your microphone and ask me a question. If you want to do that, you can easily type a question. Where do we get people? Okay, yes, I think. So far, everything is clear. So thank you uh, uh, for that comment. Um, and then there's a question as to where do we get people for the control group? So, well, maybe one of the colleagues, uh, Katrina, one of your colleagues, can help address your question. I'd be very happy for somebody to make a comment about this question. What is your own answer, Katrina? You didn't you didn't hear anything. Is is that because my microphone is uh, mute? I, I wanted to ask the question to you. 
uh, whether w- what is your own answer to the question where you can get people for control group okay you can look for volunteers yes that is that, that is one way you can say i would like to look for healthy volunteers uh, but that was uh, jaka that was your answer yeah but that's a, that's a good answer uh, to develop a hierarchy of study design suitable for our review okay. we'll cover this question very shortly that's a, that's a very good that's a very good and important question it relates to how to assess the quality of studies so we will come back to this point shortly Let, let's get the question of where we can find control groups Okay now I uh Polona did I get the requesting to annotate a shared content well I suppose I can up Okay so just like Polona you said something about depends on the type of study so remember here okay there, there is a, somebody wants to talk please go ahead yeah it's me polona that i um uh, i was like ans- answering katarina that it, it depends on which kind of study you are um, you're actually doing so if it's the cohort study uh the the controls are the one that you are not exposed to the, the subject you are um, learning about or studying about. Okay, so th- that's an important point made here. The term case control is confusing in part because the term control is used in a court study and the term control is also used in a case control study i remember the difference between the two is in a cohort study we are when we talk about control we are talking about exposure people who do not smoke for example here we are talking about people who do not have cancer so katrina can you see the difference between the two if your study is a case control design and you're talking about healthy volunteers which someone suggested was a or was an answer earlier i'm just trying to figure out who was it who suggested that yeah i'm uh, actually ja- um, jacka you suggested I'm, that for volunteers actually, or healthy volunteers so yeah, you I will need actually, to look for volunteers who you can be sure do not have cancer in this control study yes that is the suggestion mm-hmm. if you're doing a cohort study 
you actually do not know whether somebody has cancer or does not have cancer at the beginning of the study. The starting point is simply to measure how much people are smoking. Some people may not smoke at all. They will end up becoming people who we might call our control group. But some of them on follow-up will develop cancer. Make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. So it's important to when we talk about control to be very clear about whether we are talking about control in the sense of outcome or whether we are talking about control in the sense of exposure. And these are two completely different things. I'll be very happy for more questions or comments concerning what we are discussing now. And if I have missed anything that was said, and so, so Marisha, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly. I apologize for that. Uh, you, you are asking the question, cohort study evaluates risk of developing disease. So look on your question. If you are assessing mortality in a particular disease by following people up, then in this type of a cohort study, your disease is a characteristic of the participants who enter the study. Then you follow these people up with the disease. So this is your cohort that is up. And then you figure out after a number of months or years, depending on the disease, weeks or days, whether they are alive or dead. And in this case, you are evaluating the risk of death over a period of time in people with disease. So thank you for highlighting that point. Disease can be a feature of the participants in a particular cohort study. The disease can in another study where people, let's say, are at risk. For example, if you want to follow a cohort of university students to see if they develop coronavirus disease, then in this situation, the disease is an outcome measure. And in the university are you participants and you follow them up to see how many hours they are spending in class to determine their exposure to a classroom for students. In this case, disease, the coronavirus disease is your outcome. And you evaluate by following students up over a period of time, risk of developing coronavirus disease. So I hope you can see that disease is not always, the risk of disease is not always evaluated in a cohort study, it depends on what your question is. Make sense, uh, Marisha? Okay, thank you for your uh, for your answer. Any other question? So uh, I think if there are no more questions, and or, or is somebody typing? I just heard some typing uh, in the background. Maybe a question will turn up. Uh, it's going to there is a question. If I understand correctly, when you are talking about experimental exposure in a cohort study, you are talking about not receiving uh, an experimental treatment or maybe not giving up uh, a vice that could lead to an undesired uh, outcome or something like that. Okay, so uh, thank you for bringing up that point. Uh, is that Jaka who was talking? Yes. 
Okay, thank, thank you. And I hope I pronounce your name reasonably correctly. And if thank I you. have, then I apologize. It's uh, well, well, I'll now give you something that maybe you haven't come across described the way I'm about to describe. A randomized control trial is a special type of a cohort study. So when you give a new treatment to patients and compare this to standard care or a placebo, which is a control exposure, you can be comparing experiment exposure, new treatment to control exposure, standard treatment or placebo. Then if you use randomization to allocate subjects to one or the other, I'm now pointing with my with my pointer to the box concerning allocation of subjects. And see that by introducing randomization at this stage, you convert what would otherwise have been a cohort study into a randomized trial. Make sense? Or have I confused you? Um, I think I, I can follow, but uh, please do go, do go on. Okay. Anybody else amongst colleagues who is listening, left confused with what I said? Okay, Polona, thank you. You said, you just said, no, you are not confused. So I appreciate your feedback. So I think I'd like from now on for us to begin to think about these two designs. Uh, in the cohort design, we may or may not use randomization. If we use randomization and follow people up, that becomes what we call um, randomized control trial. With this background, I just like to move on to the next stage, which is. I wonder why. So to get to the next stage, I think I can take the chat away. And OK. So here. We go back now to asking questions. Can coronavirus cause lymphoproliferative disorder? Participants could be people at risk. Exposure could be those with coronavirus confirmed by a test, those without. The absence of disease confirmed test. Outcome, the disorder, lymphoproliferative disorder confirmed by histology, for example or absence of outcome confirmed by histology. And then this could be a cohort or a case control study. If we have taken people at risk and followed them up in time to see if they develop the disorder, then that will be a cohort study. You can see that in this situation, randomization will not be feasible. You cannot randomize people to receive coronavirus or not ethically. On the other hand, if you took people with lymphoproliferative disorder and went back in their records to see if they were exposed earlier on coronavirus or not, then this would be a case control study. I hope, I hope that makes sense. I'd like you now to create an example of your own. Uh, I think I, uh, Mira, you just asked if I could give an example of cohort study that is not randomized. I hope I have given you that example uh, with respect to coronavirus and lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, are you satisfied with my answer? You just said it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mirala, you are also, thank you. 
I'd like each one of you to make a question in this sense uh, using your outcome and design. It could be based on the work that you are doing in your own cases, or you have been encouraged to think about if you're just starting your thesis, or it's a paper that you have just read and would like to use it as an example, or it's a patient you have just seen last week, you have a query. So I appreciate if anyone can volunteer either by either by unmuting your microphone or by writing in the chat the various components, participants, exposure, outcome, and design. Okay, so at least uh, two, three different questions are coming up, one after the other. So let me just see if I can help. If I can. Right, we can see more here. So, um, Gaber, let me just go through your question first, which is can radiotherapy act synergistically with immunotherapy? Cancer. So basically, radiotherapy is the standard treatment or comparison. Immunotherapy combined with radiotherapy is intervention. Participants are patients with cancer, and outcome is survival. So okay, can you see, I have the, the small change that I made, Geber, in your description. Are you are you satisfied with that? With, with what changes? Excuse me. Can you please repeat that? Geber, I said the participants are people with cancer. That are already receiving immunotherapy. So okay, the, just the wait a moment. So... Immunotherapy will become the standard care or the control intervention. Combining radiotherapy with immunotherapy will become your intervention. Correct. And the outcome will be survival. So that's the small change I recommend to you. If you move immunotherapy as a comparison inside does that make sense, or or do I need to write this to explain this further? Gabe, will it help me to will it help to write, or have I explained it reasonably well? I think you you have explained it. Uh, understand. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, and then we can move to Mirella. You are talking about infertile women as participants. Then you want to perform a radiological test called hysterosalpingogram, I presume. What is the comparison for hysterosalpingogram in the infertile way for you? So, suggesting that for some women you will not use hysterosalpingogram and you will allocate them randomly. You, you want to use your microphone back to that? 
Hello, hearing? Yeah. Okay. Look, for your question, I think participants are infertile women. That is clear. Okay. The outcome uh, we is can whether do... they become pregnant, that is also yeah. clear. Yeah, all women uh, that uh, go through uh, uh, therapy uh, that are infertile, uh, most of them, uh, if they are not over aged, uh, go through this diagnostic uh, ACCG. Uh, but uh, uh, and it, this uh, uh, makes them about uh, three four months waiting until uh, they go to treatment. So we can make maybe placebo to, in comparison with the uh, ACCG. Okay. Um, How can you make the placebo? Can you tell me a little bit more? Just uh, nothing, doing nothing. Okay. So my. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, because ACCG would be, it is a diagnostic method, but it would be like a treatment. Okay. Um, uh, in this, uh, um, uh, 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 investigation. Okay. Well, th that's perfectly fine. That's a good question. Mirela. Okay. It's a good okay, example of a question for a randomized trial. Thank you. Okay. Jaka, you have also formulated a question. Uh, uh, just a sec. Um, no, I was just thinking about the uh, case control study, if I got the terminology right. Mm -hmm. um, that is the what, what I wrote in the chat. So you're going to find people with the outcome who have atypical Parkinson's disease. Yes. What, the, will the, 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 what will be the control group for these cases? Um, I mean, the, there were some cases of atypical Parkinson's disease in the tropics like Guadalupe Island. Um, and so you will go to the I, same island and find other people who have Parkinson's disease that is typical. Is that right? Um, I mean, uh, is the at the moment we need to talk about uh, our proposed uh, doctoral thesis? I mean, PhD thesis, or uh, we can talk about uh, another case that is not related. Well, you can talk about anything. I will give you my comments. But look, ultimately, it is your own supervisor with whom you will need to agree your specific hypothesis. Mm. No, I, it's just a, a proposal. I mean, uh, just how I imagined for the case uh, control study. I mean, for this case of uh, atypical Parkinson's disease. Okay. So, yeah, look, it is very to... important to figure out whether we will be following people up in time forward, prospectively, or whether you will go back in their history after confirming the presence of disease and defining them as a case with the outcome. Yes, uh, they already they already got the disease. Uh, the question is how how. What is the causative agent? Uh, and in this case, the probable causative agent is consumption of fruits of Anona muricata that are like okay. uh, some so, of. So you will need to find a group of control outcomes. Yes. They will be, they will, you will need to find that, but for the purpose of discussion today, you could say that the control outcome group will be Parkinson's disease that is typical. You will okay. take, you will go back in time to check their history of consumption of this fruit. And you would yes. hope that in the control group, the history of consumption of this fruit is lower than in the atypical Parkinson's disease cases. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly correct. So that's very good. So you, this is like a case control study where you will go back in time and discover in the past if there was greater exposure. 
Yeah. Right. So that's a good question. Then, Sarah, you also have a question. SARS-CoV-2 positive, otherwise healthy athletes. These are your participants. Exposure is... No, yes, I was just giving an example of a cohort study. We could take a group of otherwise healthy people who contracted uh, this disease and follow up for 10 years to see how many of them would develop the myocarditis and see if there is any um, bigger chance for them to develop it as uh, in the general population. So it would be a cohort study. Okay, Sarah, think about yes. this. Yes. Can you not also take a group of athletes who you know SARS-CoV-2 yes. negative? Yes. And follow them up for 10 years? Yes, yes, you are completely right. I made the mistake. The control group would be SARS-CoV negative athletes. Uh, yes, okay. of course. So, Sarah, I'm not saying you made a mistake. I'm saying there are two options. Yes, but it's more uh, comparable to take the same yes. groups. Yes. yes, if you follow people up and your starting point was similar for the two groups, then I think they will be more comparable. That is correct. Yes. So, so thank you for bringing this, this point because it helps us to see that uh, way you construct your question can create groups that are more or less comparable. Yes, so yes, totally right. Very important to spend a lot of time thinking about your question because if you haven't thought hard enough about your question, you can easily end up doing the wrong study. All right, so we've discussed immunotherapy, we've discussed uh, uh, we've discussed uh, fertility, we've discussed athletes. Uh, there is also a question about malformations. Uh, that was your text. Can you comment on that, please? Yes, sorry, it came in, in too yeah, many please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, what is the functional outcome, uh, bowel function after long-term follow-up? Uh, after posterior sagittal anorectal uh, anorectoplasty, after operation in patients with anorectal malformations. So the participants are patients with anorectal malformations uh, that were operated on, uh, and the outcome is bowel function uh, comparing to healthy non-operated or patients without anorectal malformations. And it is a case control. Okay, so let's now think about this a little bit more. Okay. Let's think about this a little bit more. Patients with anorectal malformations, that's perfectly good description. Okay. But once you make that description, I mean, how can you really have healthy controls? Patients without uh, malformations, so patients that were not operated on okay. for Look, any kind of malformation. Now, let me just ask you, did you want to compare people with and without surgery or with and without anorectal malformations? These are two different things. Yeah, but it's hard to have a patient with anorectal malformation that was not actually operated on. Like, especially, or if there are any kinds, any types of anorectal malformation that they didn't need an operation, because it's quite a diverse so, group. Okay, now let's just go back a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bit by going by saying go back more. Let's describe the question in a simple single sentence. What is it that you would like to achieve? For example, remember when I was talking about, when I see this picture, I become curious whether the driver is a man or woman. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what is the bowel and, function? Uh, and the yeah. same way Mirella, when she framed her question about hysterosalpingography, basically she asked a simple question. Yeah. Can hysterosalpingography increase the fertility? 
Okay. So what is your simple question? It, what is the functional outcome after the operation with, pa with these patients? Okay. So basically the healthy control is of no interest to you in this situation? No. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. So you want to know, so your participants are all with more malformations, exposure yes. to operation. Yes. But are there different types of operations? Uh, basically, there are possible, but basically I would want to know what is the uh, functional outcome after this kind of operation. Yes. Well, then basically, you do not have any control group. Yes. You so are simply describing <laughs> the outcome in one group. Okay. And this type of a study is a prognostic study. Yes. And at the end of your study, you will be able to say, out of 100 people, this, or 200 this people, good. whatever this the go, number was, yeah. this what go percentage well. had a particular outcome? Okay. So you don't need a case, you don't need a control, you don't need, or maybe if you're comparing two well, functioning, yes. So now, are mm -hmm. you talking about control exposure or a no. control with respect to outcome? It is outcome, yes. One, uh, if outcome is the, the, the operation, then yes. You look what, what's happening with the, with the patients, how, the, how is their bowel function. If you are the outcome the, is bowel function. The outcome is bowel function. So it yeah. is. It's, so based on what you've told me, yeah. I believe you simply want to calculate the bowel function success of the operation through the rate of the bowel function. Yeah. Yeah. But do you think it's possible that the anorectal malformation come in different levels of severity? Yes, they do. Well, in this case, now you are talking about something different. Your that patients you are, your participants are patients who all have operation. Mm -hmm. And you can see the exposure is that the severity of malformation is different. Mm -hmm. so they have a, they are exposed to more severe malformation or less yes. severe malformation. Okay. Now you can say you can the compare. operation gives a different outcome mm -hmm. according to the severity of malformation. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? More interesting, but it's been said. <laughs> so, you say, say it one more time. No, so it's more interesting, but it's already been proven. Well, then you need to study a different question. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. This is okay, the this but, is the uh, beginning. But I think this discussion was helpful because yes, colleagues can see me. that what you were imagining was participant in fact changed into exposure mm -hmm. in light of our discussion. Okay, thank you. So the, 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 the confusion between whether something is an exposure or an outcome or participant is common. So I'd like you to think that even experienced researchers can be confused about this. This is not an easy part of science. The difficult part of science is figuring out the right question. Okay, we now move to... Uh, so, Katrina has a question. Case con you know, Katrina, give the answer first. So I can comment on your answer. Hello. Um, yes. Sorry, I didn't hear you in the in um, right now. 
for a few uh, moments. What did you say? Can you repeat? In the past. So the answer yeah. to that okay. is you yes. Were missing the, answer. the answer yes. to this part of the question is yes. And the next question you say is, is this retrospective? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't hear you. Um, I don't hear your answer. <laughs> well, um, looking through what um, you and our colleagues have uh, spoken about, I have a sense that the case control study is always retrospective. So you are looking first at the outcome of some disease or some something that you are of your question and then uh you look back through um through the symptoms or through the uh, information of your patients and you research what they did have or didn't have for example exposure to cigarettes um in patients with um, lung cancer let's say so i i have a feeling that it is always retrospective so please correct me if i'm wrong In school, Excuse me? Call it retrospective. Whether you call this traveling back in time retrospective. Uh -huh. Okay, maybe I don't understand really well what that means. Yeah, maybe. I... You know what, Katrina? Even I don't understand whether that is what retrospective means. Uh huh. Okay. And I'm doing research. You know that I published my first paper 30 years ago. Yes. If you're confused, please don't consider yourself the only person who's confused about it. Okay. okay, thank you. Let's um, go so, describe so, this clearly. Mm -hmm. I can give you my definition. This may not be the same as that in the textbook. Mm -hmm. I can okay, also yes, give you my definition, mm -hmm. but it may not be that of your supervisor. Okay. But yes, I please. I would <laughs> like to make clear that case control study is what you describe, which is it is always looking for symptom or exposure in the. Mm -hmm. That is a question of what does retrospective mean? I give you my definition of retrospective. Well, I give you my definition of prospective. I actually okay. don't know what retrospective means. Prospective is. You have what you are before identifying cases and controls and before asking them. Mm -hmm. Their exposure in the is possible to do that, Katrina? Well, unfortunately, I haven't heard the whole of your answer. So um, uh, it seems like we have some problems with the sound. I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should all mute while you are talking or wh while one is talking. So maybe um, if you can just quickly repeat if it's not a problem. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's absolutely not a problem for me to repeat. I say. Identify all the cases. Also, tomorrow, day after, you identify all the controls. And you ask the people what were their exposures in the past. This will be a prospective study. What your protocol before you collected the data? You follow what I said? Um, partially, yes. Okay, so you, you write protocol beforehand in prospective and in retrospective, you just look back to all the documentation that you already gathered, like you, um, in your group. Well, look, uh, please don't become too worried about what is the exact definition. 
Because I think if you ask 10 different people, you will get 10 different definitions. Uh -huh. Okay. The important thing is you understand fully what is a case control design. And based on what you wrote in your message, I am confident that you understand fully what is a case control design. Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. And now there is uh, Jaka, you have uh, more clear explanation about your question, so that's good. Yours is a case control design. Um, Trina, you have, you're trying to help us to figure out how we can all hear better. Thank you for that. Uh, right. I think everybody agrees. I'd like to move on to to the next stage. I'd like to reassure you all that in all of my 400 papers that I have written, the most difficult of those papers was to formulate the question correctly. And I can also tell you that I, sometimes I have not formulated the question correctly. I've discovered it later. And I have repented that I should have spent more time thinking before taking the first step. I encourage you all to spend more time thinking about the question. All right. Now I tell you something about a writing tip. To use the question to write the title of the paper. Uh, or the title of your thesis. So you can imagine that to get to the moon took uh, millions of dollars, hundreds of companies, thousands of people, many years of work, and all of this was just described in three words on the moon, and then with a little sub after that, which has seven words. And then there is more detail described, right? And you can see that people will probably not read this detail. They will only read the title and the subtitle, maybe the abstract a bit more. So my advice on writing titles is around the length of a tweet, that it should be very specific and it should use elements from the question put in question marks inside your title. If the title has, uh, and your title should comply with the instructions of your universities, guidance for thesis or the reporting guidelines of the journal. And if there is no abstract allowed, then the title can give result. And here I give you an example of a title from one of my papers, published papers. You can see that I've given the study design. I've also given the intervention. And I think within what I've described, the outcome is also implicit. So can you see that how the title uses the information from uh, your structured question? And I'll go on and give you one more example. In this title, you can see that the design is described. The intuition is described, and the outcome is described. So I hope you can see that the exercise of constructing the question is to get your question right for your research. But it's also very helpful to formulate the title of your paper or the title of your thesis. The next question is how to convert this question into 
a search strategy for a systematic review. So from the same paper that I showed you a moment ago as an example of a title, here you can see that the intervention was described as tests for prediction. And it's a whole load of tests for prediction. The participants are women with pre here. And here are the complications amongst women with pre can develop and that we would like to use through systematic review. in order to find tests that can predict these complications, later development of these complications. So you see that the formulation of the question can lead to identification of the search terms. So literature search emerges from the question In simple terms, you can take the population, test, outcome, design. For each piece, you can identify search terms. And I'll show you an example of how that can be done in a second. But basically, you should apply these search terms to capture all the evidence by putting them into various databases. And the first thing you need to do is to search for existing reviews of your question if you're going to plan a systematic review. So going back to this question, we have search terms. We first convert those search terms into combinations using and and or. This becomes the search strategy. And this search strategy should be defined in Appendix 1 and Figure 1 of your published paper or in the chapter of your thesis. And you can do that via PubMed, where you can search for hash terms. And if you registered in PubMed, your search will be stored. You can combine the various terms using AND or OR. So here is an example from the same title that I showed you a moment ago. All of the terms for the population are combined with OR. All of the terms for tests are combined with OR. You can see that constructing the search term combination requires a lot of thinking. There are more than 96 terms already. By the time we come to come the search terms for tests and outcomes, and these are all combined within the outcome. So you have now three sets combined with all, and then you combine them with and. Does that make sense? This type of detail information should be included as a table, as an appendix in your thesis chapter or in your published paper. More like an appendix in your published paper than as a table in the published paper. And uh, all of the information can be summarized into a figure like this. So here is the figure concerning the population. All of these combinations occur via OR. All the tests were combined via OR. Outcomes were combined via OR, and they were all combined by AND. And this information should be presented as figure one. At this stage, I'm very happy to take any questions. <clears throat>
Let's see, what's the question? <clears throat> okay, so in general, there are not any tools or programs that can search and collect literature from all the databases all at once. And people who are working in artificial intelligence are developing these types of tools, including in my own university here in Canada. Uh, so, yes, systematic review is a lot of work. How long will it take for artificial intelligence to get there? Uh, if you ask me realistically, it will be definitely after your thesis has been submitted and passed. So, please don't expect for it to be available for your use within your thesis work. In fact, you can imagine that there could be many people like you doing a PhD about how to develop these tools. Maybe if one of your supervisors works in artificial intelligence, you can ask them if they would like to work in this area with you as part of your thesis work. Anybody wishes to make any more comments other than the difficulties of conducting this? Well, artificial intelligence require the use of artificial intelligence requires programming knowledge or computer science expertise. But to conduct searches in MBase and PubMed, etc., does not require computer programming knowledge, it requires understanding your question. It requires understanding how the mesh terms or index terms or keywords will capture the concepts related to your question. That does not require programming knowledge. So, Marisha, I will ask, answer your question about how many studies can there be in a systematic review in just one second. I ask you a question, to all a question to consider. Can there be a systematic review published with zero studies included? Ah. Nika asked me a question. What is Jaka? I think your no is answer to my question. There cannot be a systematic review published with zero studies. I believe that is what your no is about. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. All right. It'd be helpful if other people could also think about the answer to my question. But coming back to Nika. Remember, meta-analysis is only a statistical technique used at the end of performing a systematic review. Meta-analysis is nothing other than performing a specific statistical analysis inside a systematic review. Does, does that make sense, Nika? Or if you are confused, I will need to go back and explain that basic concept. Alexander will come back to okay. Alexander will come back to answer your question. Why not in a second? Let me just uh, see if we can go back to my slides. So, can there be a review published without studies included? Here is a systematic review published in the BMJ. It's about Accuracy of signs and symptoms in acute conjunctivitis. It conducted a search and found 6,872 references. And it found only one eligible study. And it found that this eligible study had such a poor quality 
that it could not be included in the systematic review. So in fact, you can see that even a top journal like BMJ has published a systematic review with zero studies included. <laughs> so you can see that in a systematic review, the process is important. Any colleagues have comments about what you have just seen? Thank you. Uh, I think I think the slide explained your point, Alexander. Good point. Okay, so we're going to move to the next stage, which is thinking about uh, how to convert your question into title objective search. This is something I'd like you to do on your own, perhaps during the rest of the day before we meet tomorrow. And I hope if some of you have had opportunity to time and opportunity to do this exercise, then we can discuss your example with colleagues tomorrow. How does that sound? Great. So, Maja, thank you. I take your answer as a general answer on behalf of all the colleagues in the group. At this time, I would like to show you a little bit about how you can use information from the structured question to write the objective statement of your abstract and the introduction section of your paper. So, I don't know if you have had a chance to ever come across checklists like Prisma. Have you come across anything like Prisma before? No. All right. So, let me see if I can quickly jump to, jump to Prisma and show you show you Prisma what there is, so that we can address this point straight away. Okay. There is something called Equator website. In the Equator website, and I'd encourage you all to check out this website sometime before tomorrow, you can find all different checklists that exist to help you in determining what should be reported in your submitted manuscripts. And these are the various names for the different checklists. So Prisma checklist found on Equator website concerned systematic reviews, which is the topic of today. So Prisma checklist looks like this. It tells you what to write in the title and the abstract and in the objective section. And you can see from here that it is asking you to use components of your question called participants, interventions, exposures, outcomes, and study design to write your objective. And Prisma P is a checklist or writing protocol of systematic reviews. And you can use the information from Prisma P. Uh, so here I was showing you an example of a published systematic review where uh, checklist describes the various components. Acqu according to Prisma checklist, these components are described in the same way as in the example I showed you a moment ago. And here is a recommendation on 
your systematic reviews before conducting your systematic reviews. So your review becomes a prospective study. Remember said that a prospective study is one where the protocol is written before the research is undertaken. And this title that we've seen a moment ago was a published protocol of a systematic review published in a peer-reviewed journal. And the Prisma P checklist is a tool to use for testing with how to write protocols for systematic reviews. And we have seen the equator test now already. Prospero is the database for registration of systematic review topics. And this is also a website freely available where you can register your review. And it gives you guidance on how to register. And now I tell you a little bit about how to construct the objective part of your introduction. In the manuscript that you will write, or in the chapter that you will write in your thesis. Now remember that thesis chapter or a published manuscript is not a textbook chapter. So it's not necessary to describe a lot of detail about about um, review in a systematic review paper or in a systematic review chapter concerning is basically you can focus on describing use systematic review what is the disease burden then next, you can describe why is needed. And in this case, you need to describe whether there are no systematic reviews or if there are existing systematic reviews, but they are of poor quality or they are up to date. So once evident that there are no systematic reviews or no reviews of good quality or no up to date reviews, you can then conduct your new systematic review. And then We'll come back to cover this later. The next section that you need to write is a section concerns the objective. Concerning your objective, The key thing in your objective is to define give me a second till I find the correct uh, correct slide. Um, Right, so here we are about concerning the objective. <clears throat> you need to describe the objective using participants, interventions, and outcome. And this information can directly go into the third paragraph of the introduction. Can you see that? So for homework for tomorrow, where we are discussing, where I'm encouraging you to convert your question into an objective statement and think about the search strategy. I'd like you to draft two or three lines that will describe your objective.
people to write something on the line said the objective of my thesis or my chapter four or my paper was to evaluate amongst participants blah 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 the effect of intervention or exposures blah 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 and outcomes blah 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 using the design this control study or a cohort study make sense so we have been together for nearly an hour and 40 minutes i think we have covered quite a lot today my proposal would be that uh, at uh, i stop talking uh, at this time i go back to uh, i go back to um we we were so i just like to very quickly uh remind you where we stand so we have so far covered how to frame a question and how to plan literature search also figured out how to write the title of the paper or the chapter or the thesis using the question you to use your question to construct an objective statement also to think about the literature search strategy for your question and prepare the objective statement and the question for tomorrow and at this stage i like to leave our uh, last at uh, 15 minutes open for discussion comments questions as well as a wish list to be covered for tomorrow and day after okay so um i'm very happy to take any questions at this stage can i just check that the task for tomorrow is clear to everyone so that that's good some questions coming in so that, that's good thank you so my uh, first uh, my chair your question is uh, okay i you ask me to sum it up again so i would like you to construct an objective statement of your question of your structured question that you will use to write inside your chapter thesis chapter or your manuscript for publication this is only two or three lines so i'm not asking you to write a long thesis simply three or 
lines maximum on which I can comment tomorrow as to whether it describes your structured question clearly enough. Okay, and then I'd like to cover Ava's point about uh, mesh terms or not in just one second. Um, what if you do not have a question? Well, Katsina, then I guess for someone like you who does not have a question yet, you can think about a number of questions and bring them for discussion tomorrow. I have no problem discussing a range of questions, but someone like you will be able to benefit from others who bring examples of their own worked questions. Eva, your question is uh, um, about strategies. And yes, you're it is about mesh terms, actually. Um, I was wondering if we only use mesh terms and these Boolean operators, or how do you call it, call them, and on, or, or. Um, we probably use a lot, um, leave a lot of studies out, don't we? If we only use mesh term words. You are right. I don't recommend using mesh terms only. I recommend using mesh terms along with free terms. So okay. if you don't mind, I'll just go back to my slide to give you uh, to go back in the slide to take you to what I was describing earlier. Um, or maybe forward because I can't go back. Okay, so I summarize for you. You choose search terms, and the search terms are both mesh and free text terms. And then each of these set of free terms within a concept are combined with or. So I show you an example of that. Under the population, the term preeclampsia, preeclampsia, versions of preeclampsia, Blah, 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 are all, as you can see, combined with or. So within one concept, the mixture, mesh, and free text combined with or. And when this is complete for each concept, and by each concept I mean each component related to participants, intervention, and outcome, these concepts are together combined with and. Does that make sense, Eva? Yeah, it does. I can see it now. And just to emphasize this a little further, this can then be described in the figure. So you can see that when you combine with or, the number becomes very big. Three million, more than three million patients. But when you combine them with and, this is what brings the number down. Can you? Is that clear? Yeah, it is. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, now this brings back to the chat and uh, any, any any comments or questions that colleagues have. Please feel free to come forward. Okay, if there are no, no okay, is, there, uh, is everything you presented today in your book? Yes, and more than what I have. Yes, it's all there. And uh, yes, where can you find my book? Let me see if I can find it for you uh, quickly. If you go, if you search, 
So here is my website called professorkhalidkhan.com. And if you go at the bottom of the site, you will see Amazon. And on Amazon, you can find my book. So, th so this is the easiest way to find my book. Uh, for anybody who's looking for the book. Make sense? Right. Then, uh, Take us back to the uh, task for tomorrow. From a framed question, construct an objective statement and think about the search strategy. That makes sense to you, right? This is more or less what the activity is for tomorrow. And, now, and I'd like to talk about tomorrow what if you have anything specific in mind for me to cover? Okay, I'll, I'd also like to ask if uh, if what I presented was clear and is there anything I should change or could change to make tomorrow more productive? So Sarah, you say it was clear. Thank you. Gaber, it was, thank you. Uh, Gaber, thank you also. Anna? Katrina, thank you for your comment also. Katrina, I'm sorry, pronunciation is not easy for me. Oh, well, look, most of you are. Okay. So it is that you are comfortable with the speed at which I'm working and the range of topics that I am covering with you. I'll stick to the same style. Uh, maybe we will cover a little bit less than what I had planned, but it is more important that we understand the things. Please ask me, what is your, Sarah, you ask a question. Nothing is too basic. So let us see what is, what was your question? We would review the different study types. We will definitely cover the different study types tomorrow, Sarah. That's uh, definitely no problem. We, we will cover them tomorrow. That's part of my plan. Uh, but th but thank you for raising this. This is a this is a very very important. Remember, Sarah, we've covered two study types today. Well, at least three covered: cohort study, case control study, and randomized as a set of a cohort study. So we, we will we will review these study types one more time and look at what is specific about each. Oh, yes, we. Will. Oh, well, if there is not any more question or comment or suggestion, then I think it is okay for us to bring this session to an end. And uh, I it. can- Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for today. So so I hand over to Matej to, uh, I'm sorry, Matej, if I don't pronounce your name correctly, but I'll stop sharing the okay. screen. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll wait Thank till you, you bring Thank to you. closure and then I will leave. Thank you very much for today. So we meet again tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Okay. Uh, at the same time, at the same time. Okay. Good, good night. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Bye.